Welcome to Confirmation Bias, presented by the League Ambassadors. I'm Ambassador Kenny Ken Ken. And if there was one NFL franchise that couldn't afford to play fast and loose with the rules around common decency, it's definitely got to be the team with literally the most offensive name in team sports. Mm. Hello, Washington. And that's my confirmation bias. I'm Ambassador Dad, and this is America. And only in America can one week ago Kanye tell us all that slavery was a choice. And then a week later... Childish Gambino drops one of the dopest, deepest music videos of all time. And that's my confirmation bias. Speaking of skins, a little, <laughs> little irony for you. The Redskins refuse to give up the name Redskins, but they want their cheerleaders to give up the skins. And that's my confirmation bias. Now, Ambassador Chef Curry. The greatest fight I've ever seen was between Wayne Bill and Rasheen Winchester Back in 1993 or 94. Either way, it's still a hood classic. And to this day, we still can't agree on who won. And that's my confirmation bias. Welcome to Confirmation Bias. This is episode 47, second season of our multi-sports vodcast. Uh, as a reminder, you can follow us everywhere on social media. Our handle is at the League AM. That is Twitter. That is Facebook. That is Instagram. Uh, also, please check out our website, theleagueam.com. Uh, on that website, you can see previous episodes of our show, Confirmation Bias, as well as our NFL show, 32 Kings Road. Please check out our blog spot, Diplomatic Community, which is on our website, theleagueam.com. And finally, please, please, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, League Ambassadors. We've got a great show today. We're going to talk about some baseball, some boxing, some basketball, some NCAA, some hockey. Dev. Let's get it cracking, sir. Uh, yeah, just give me a moment. I'm still trying to get over Kev's confirmation bias. That's a super <laughs> Baltimore Revere Park thing. Yeah, I see it uh, touched your heart. You <laughs> that shit is hilarious, Kevin. Uh, we know Wayne won. I'll, I'll go on a limb. Wayne, you won. Rasheen got one shot in. Okay, let's move on. Let's get into hot topics. Kev <laughs> acting like Wayne didn't win, though. <laughs> Kevin was three. <laughs> and I his still head, remember. And his head was the same size. Exactly. So, <laughs> oh, um, my God. So... Prior to this show, as of right now, there's only been one team that was eliminated from the semi uh, semifinal round uh, in the NBA playoffs, and that was Toronto Raptors. Yeah, we'll cover Utah and uh, <laughs> New Orleans on Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> as of right now, that is it. Right. Um, so we're going to do a little bit of NBA postmortem as we do on this show. Um, so they lost in a sweep. 4-0 to the Cavs. Uh, when is, by the way, when is the last time a one seed has been swept in the NBA playoffs? Does anybody know? Uh, that I don't know. I don't know it either. I don't can't recall it. Google Kevin. Just saying, that's <laughs> yeah. another feather in the cap. That's another feather in the cap of LeBron. Keep they, going, Dad. Okay, so <laughs> so uh, they obviously they were a number one seed early exit. Um, so I think we need to break down what's the next moves for them. So I think the first question which came up almost immediately uh was it was white people early exit oh we like that omar <laughs> okay um is the first move to fire Dwayne casey um i'm surprised he still got a job you know listen the organization took some ownership last off season they said hey mm -hmm. you know we need to get younger on the bench they doubled down mm -hmm. on their two young stars right 
And then Casey started out the season, said we're going to play a little bit differently. So yep. you made an adjustment. Change from the pick and roll offense. Change from the pick it and roll works. offense. It worked in the regular season. But here we are in the playoffs going up against LeBron and the Cavs, and you still lose. So I don't know if there are any but more it, tricks left in the bag. It's not that they just lost, though. It's how they lost. I agree. And and how it occurred that mm. it doesn't matter what was done in the season. You've you've gone as far as you can go with how things are situated now. But Kevin, is that his fault? No, but he will get blamed for it uh, because, as we mentioned before, the head coach is usually the first one to go before the star players. Um, but even still, despite them getting rid of Casey, that's not necessarily going to fix the psychological shortcomings that <laughs> this team has. And no, no joke on DeMar Ro- DeRozan at all in that respect. But oh. it's obvious <laughs> that they shut up, Kenyon. It's obvious <laughs> they do struggle. Yes, they do struggle up against up against LeBron. I mean, they they were obviously the better team, but. Uh, DeRozan and Lowry just can't get over that hump, man. So I think Casey has to go. And then if they can't get it done without Casey, then some trades and some cuts and some It just wasn't you know, in God's plan. Huh. Well, yeah. oh, 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 we need to pause for that. <laughs> yeah, let, let, that, let that live. Good job, Omar. But my, my question to you guys, are, all right, I get it. Uh, he, he was able to change the culture. They have this hurdle they can't get over. Um, but they... If if you look at when he took the franchise over, as far as like uh, their wins and losses, he's up there with some of the top coaches in the league with regards to you know regular season. Listen, I'm a firm believer that you have some coaches that are good at taking you from nothing mm-hmm. and turning you into something, and that's as good as they can be. And then there are coaches that are obviously good at everything. That's like this many. And then there are coaches who are good at taking teams that are something Mm -hmm. and getting them over the hump. It's clear that he's not that. 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 And that's okay. Because if you look at it, there's only three other coaches that have the same amount of tenure as he he mm -hmm. does, which is Carlisle, Spolstra, and Pop. He's not up there with Pop. Here's the thing. He has he, more wins than Carlisle, and if it wasn't for the Heatles, he'd have more wins than Spolster, too. Right, but all of those three guys, have they've wins. all won. <laughs> yeah. he should, And I still believe he should be in the conversation for Coach of the Year for what he did this year. It could be Kevin. You were going to say something? Yeah, he's that Mark Jackson. He got them <laughs> as far as <laughs> he could get them, <laughs> and it's time for somebody else to One step more, in and try to do what he couldn't. One more thing. All they got to do is wait a couple weeks. LeBron's gone anyway, so he, he might be able to get them over the hump next year. Yeah, but I that, that's true. But I believe there's a such thing, aside from, you know, the profile of what type of coach he is, I also mm. believe there's a such thing as just sometimes the message gets stale. The message gets stale. And, yeah. clearly, and, and clearly there's a disconnect between him and DeRozan. And this is not the first time, you know, he got, you know, he was benched in the fourth quarter when they made their run. DeRozan had something to say about it. This is not the first time that that has happened. The organization clearly has already stayed take their claim with Kyle Lowry and DeRozan. They're not going anywhere. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you just got to switch out the messenger. So speaking about uh, switching out the messenger, say they're unable to do that, or maybe they do, but what kind of moves can they make to improve over this offseason? I mean, to me it looks like they're kind of limited in what they can do. Everybody's basically signed up for next year, 2019, the, the and most of them do, for 2020 as The only well. thing they can do is blow it up if they want to make changes. They have to give. The only, they, they have to trade one of those stars that they have. Well, which, which one do you give up though? Yeah. Both. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't mean I'm not I'm not impressed with either one of them. I honestly mm-hmm. think that you know, oftentimes when we have these conversations, that usually is the go-to is to yeah. say to blow, blow it up. up. I think with them, I think I think it's clear they've just got to change the the captain of the ship. And I think it's 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 someone to come in with a so different stamp. I think sta- yeah, stamp because they went young with the bench. They've got a mm-hmm. great bench, probably one of the best if not the best bench in basketball. Bench stretch leads and, every game. And they are all not young. The they're all they're <laughs> all young. They're all, I mean, it, but it's, uh, okay, that's fine, but they got experience. So you right. you give them credit for that. And again, next year the East looks different. Yeah, they're locked in they're <laughs> locked in with their starters. I don't think the issue is personnel. I think mm-hmm. it's just time for a new voice. And a new vision. Okay. Well, uh, cha- <laughs> let me know when y'all done. Change in speed. Uh, no, no, you, you might be interested in this one. We're going to talk a little bit about some Major League Baseball. Oh, okay. Yeah, <laughs> so uh, you're moving too fast. Yeah, I'm, moving reading, too fast. I'm reading the yeah, paper. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so the uh, MLB International Series. Um, so it was announced today uh, or recently that the Red Sox and Yankees will play in London in mm-hmm. 2019. Mm-hmm. It'll be the first ever MLB game in uh, in Europe. 
Um, this is the part of the show where I say, again, this is why the League Ambassadors exist. Exactly. We exist for this reason. And that's a great series to put out there. It is. Yeah. Um, and, you know, this year they're showing uh, strides, you know, with the international game. A couple years ago, um, the Dodgers, I think, opened in Australia. Right. Uh, then this year, the Dodgers and Padres played in Mexico. That's and right. And the Indians and Twins played in Puerto Rico. I would I'm, argue just the Padres played in Mexico, but go ahead. So, <laughs> and then also uh, next year, the A's and the Mariners will open in Tokyo. Awesome. So, yeah. So, um, the international, I mean, do you think that this is the best move for them trying to follow in the uh, NFL footsteps? Well, again, not to toot the horn of the league ambassadors, but. What you going to toot the fuck away? <laughs> right. Uh, we, we, we exist because the leagues themselves, again, are, it's saturated. The market is saturated here in America. So the only way to grow the game is to grow it globally. Um, will it? Will the success that the NFL has had abroad translate to the MLB? I'm dubious to that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a slower game. It's a longer game. Um, I actually was just having a conversation with someone from the UK yesterday, and we were talking about baseball. And the same sort of feedback that we have about the game, right. they have as well. So, you know, it's something new. It's something different. Um, but And then you look at the fact cricket, right, is a similar type of game in terms of the mm -hmm. setup, but it's much faster in pace, much more entertaining. There's more more points scored. So, uh, you know, it, I think the jury's still out they on that. They are being smart about the matchups they're, they're sending to Absolutely. the A's and the Mariners because they have big Asian followings yeah. because of the players that they've had on their mm -hmm. teams. That's perfect teams to send over there. Yeah. Like the, the intensity of the Yankees-Red Sox series, that's, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, people understand that hate. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. But are any of you willing to fly over there to watch a game? <laughs> No, <laughs> and that you know what, and and that's, that's and that is the question. That's the point, feet, right? Rocks. <laughs> that's that is the point, Kev. Okay, so now um, let me know when you're done. All right, Omar's checked out. <laughs> we we actually need to get a, a three a three shot mic. <laughs> so, when we do My hockey, feet swinging right. on the bench. So let's uh, let's talk a little bit about. I just uh, black them out. The uh, NHL playoffs. Um, an update. We talked on, on last show about the the Capitals ghosts, uh, and they finally finally have uh, exercised their demons, mm -hmm. and they, they beat the Penguins, um, who has beaten them in, uh, they've lost to them every single time they played in the playoffs, three game sevens. Um, this is the first D.C.-based team to actually get to the Final Four in 20 years. That's including the, the Wizards, uh, the Nationals, um, the Indigenous people. Right. All those cats can't get out of the fucking uh, the division around. Um, Kev. Is this their year? <laughs> is this your team now? No. Uh, they're, they're probably my team for, for the night just because, you know, it's, it's a lot of excitement going on in the area. But, I mean, Devin mentioned their, their failures. I mean, they're 1-9 against Pittsburgh series-wise um, in franchise history, and they haven't beaten them since 94. So to get over this hump, honestly, this was the Cat Stanley Cup. Like, anything <laughs> after this, in my eyes, they playing with house money. Um, but what I think is interesting in terms of the the bigger the bigger picture this is actually like the worst of the caps teams within the last like three years or so like this is the third year of a two-year window to actually win it and the fact that this team is the mm. one that finally beat pittsburgh is interesting in terms of them winning the whole thing though we gotta pump our brakes on that well you know you talked about it they're playing with house money in their favor they got a hot goalie in Braden holtby Works well for them. And in this upcoming series against Tampa Bay, even though I picked Tampa Bay to make it to the Stanley Cup, they have the most talented player in Ovechkin. So those things, it's it's in their favor. You know, we'll see what happens. Yeah, the fashion that they won in though, was spectacular. That was very exciting. Hmm. That was very interesting, fellas. <laughs> <laughs> All right, it's time for Black vs. Blue. Couldn't come sooner. Whew. All right, uh, Mr. Pujols, join the 3000 Club, the Mile High Club. Is that newsworthy or nothing to see here? Kind of. 3,000 hits. No, nah, it, nah, it, it's newsworthy because he's only the fourth player to ever get 3,000 hits and 600 home runs. Yeah, that's what. That's the sweetener. That's, that's the sweetener other than because he has been underwhelming. Is that what you call it? 
<laughs> I mean, but that's what they paid him for, right? Like that's mm-hmm. what you do in baseball is you try you give one final big contract to the player who's going to be cracking a bunch of milestones at the end of his career because mm-hmm. that puts butts in seats. It's you know it's a plus that the Angels are winning this year. But when you talk about you know Hank Aaron, Willie Mays, <clears throat> A Rod. Um, and a rod, um, <laughs> and that's the club. Hey, stick to ball, and stick that's the ball. club, and that's the club that you are a part of. Um, I definitely think that's newsworthy for sure, and especially how he represents himself in the game. I that's one of the reasons why it's it's something that should be talked about. Although I have seen him in person, um, because how uh, old is he? <laughs> right, he's old. Uh, uh, because my uh, best friend from high school, major league baseball player, um, doesn't play now, guys. Don't look at me like that. I don't know what you're talking, talking about. about. But <laughs> Albert Pujols has a large cranium. But he's always had a large cranium. <laughs> yeah, I'm telling you, you got to see it in person. <laughs> oh, so damn. I'm just saying, in about 15 years, when another, said, mid- when another Mitch... When another... They say cranium. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. I was very strategic <laughs> with my word choice. When we hear... If there's another Mitchell report in 15 years and Albert mm. Pujols is on it, I'm just saying, don't be surprised. Mitchell going to be dead and stinking. <laughs> damn. All right, moving on. <laughs> so it's all out war. Body armor is coming for Gatorade's mm. head. Yeah. Kobe said, let's go at him. Attack. Can they, is it uh, a hit or flop? Can they take on Gatorade, the giant in the industry? I'd say it's a hit just because they have former and current players. Like you mentioned Kobe. I believe James Harden did a couple ads Mm -hmm. uh, that are like really behind him. And I mean, those are two guys that are the face of the NBA culture right now. Um, So I think anything that Kobe's getting behind creatively, I personally support. (laughs) Um, I, I haven't tasted the, the drink, couldn't really care if it's good or not, but I think they have a chance, similar to how um, how Under Armour did with Nike, how they kind of just chipped away at that, you know, at, at their, mm-hmm. their grasp on 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 the um, I'm drawing market the share, Sorry. market oh, no, share, the market share. Thank yes. you, Mr. Kenyon. But and it took them it took them years to get to get to get there. But I think if, if Body Armour continues to have players back them and be in their ads and support them, that I mean, you never know, man. They could. I'm yeah. gonna preface this by saying Body Armour. Come holler at us. Yeah. It tastes good. Hey, and Under Armour owns a city now, right, Kev? They do. They own all of South Baltimore. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like another show in itself. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. All right. So they call her, they call her Miss Carter. On Monday, uh, Miss Carter, Wendell Carter's mom, uh, at was at a... Um, a meeting for the at the night commission on intercollegiate athletics, um, and I'm just going to read you the paragraph. It was an em- an emotional speech to say the least, um, and this is just one paragraph from from what she said. Uh, when you remove all the bling and the bells and the sneakers and all that, she said, you've paid for a child to come to your school to do what you wanted them to do for you for free, and you made a lot of money when he did that, and you've got. All the rules in place that say he cannot share in any of that. The only other time when labor does not get paid, but yet someone else gets profits and the labor is black and the profit is white is in slavery. Mm. And that's not all she said, but just (laughs) right. Um, This is America. (laughs) Is it hope or hype that Miss Carter, in her emotional speech, bringing attention to this situation, will bring change finally? to the way the NCAA runs its system. I think it's hope because times are changing with social media awareness. Uh, companies don't want to have that scrutiny now. Um, so maybe the powers to, to be will change. I mean, the NFL came out with something where they're thinking about not making players stand for the national anthem because of the backlash. So I don't know. What but is the difference between that it's, and it's team by team decision? Right, but it's not, yeah, they make it a team decision. But that that's definitely bending on what they their previous stance right. so i i hope it, it makes a, a difference i doubt it i am also hopeful but i agree i think it's hype just because using black bodies for white profit is is america and unless you think this country is going to fall within the next couple of years then unfortunately this system is going to keep going and I, I can understand people saying like oh look you know these players get uh, you know, a free education, and we can sit here and dedicate another show to what that really means. But at the end of the day, the owners, the institutions, the organizations are always going to end up winning out 
compared to these players, and they'll just rinse and repeat and recycle another player in there to fill those same shoes. Um, I, I think it's hopeful because coming out of that meeting, um, Arn, Arnie Duncan, who was actually the commissioner of the or the, the chairman of the Knight Commission, of which that meeting was held, um, not only in response to her comments, but also in response to the findings and the recommendations of the Rice Commission, of which Condoleezza Rice was uh, was the chairman of that looked at uh, the NCAA and examined its practices in lieu of the recent controversies with uh, the boosters and, and the shoe companies. Um, Arn, Arnie Duncan said that the only way there's going to be real change uh, is there has to be independent oversight. So in other words, right now you have the Board of Governors, the NCAA Board of Governors, which is basically comprised of a bunch of Division I presidents that sit on that, uh, sit on that group. Uh, the commission, the, the, the Rice Commission that was created, is a bunch of people that are connected to the NCAA. And his point was that just like any other government or business organization has independent oversight in order to recommend and instill changes, the same thing needs to happen for the NCAA. So I'm hopeful that when you look at what she said, when you look at the lawsuit that uh, what was the kid's name? Um, Colby. Uh, forgive out of, North, listen listen be. Yes, listen out, of, out, of, out of Northwestern, there was a, a tremendous expose that was done on Real Sports by yeah. Brian Gumbel that talks about that. I think you look at there's a there's a there's a swell that's happening, a, a current that is building um, that's going to push, I think, the NCAA to change. Otherwise, what's going to happen, I think, is people are going to start to turn away from it. So hopefully the creation of an independent oversight committee will will instill the change that that, that we all want to see for the NCAA. Kev, what did you say? White profit for what? Say it again. Black bodies for no, white say, profit. Black bodies for white profit. Sort of like the studio and Mike. Hmm. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, my God. Ring the bell, Someone please. Someone had to the show going, Mike turned red as shit. <laughs> like he on camera. Hey, no, then you got to drop a bomb on Mike. Keep, keep him on his toes. Hey, Mike, let me let me step in and save you here. We're going on to the next segment. <laughs> our infamous Is You With It or Not yes, sir. segment. And our two combatants tonight is Ambassador Dad and Ambassador Kenny Ken Ken. They will be debating which is the best fight of all time between... Jose Castillo and Diego Corrales, or the thriller in Manila between Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier, part three. Uh, so we got Omar judging the debate. He's got the coin. Dev, call it in the air. Tails. Tails. Hmm. Decisions. Motherfucker. <laughs> we all know who you picking. I dare you. I go Corrales Castillo. Thank just, you. Just for fun. Uh, oh, Devin is definitely going first. Here, give me the clock. <laughs> he tried to give it 10 seconds. Like, that's not his favorite fight. Nah, because I didn't want. I made some good points for the other one. Uh, oh, you already started. Okay, so um, unlike the thriller in Manila, which we all knew was going to be an epic fight between some legends, uh, this was an unexpected treat for boxing. I myself didn't actually see this fight live. I saw it a week later. And the reason why is because there was a pay-per-view fight the following week between Tito Trinidad and Winky Wright. And I was at a fight party, and that fight was boring as shit because Winky Wright beat the shit out of Tito. Um, so it was so bad, the host of the fight party said, I feel bad, guys. Let me turn on this other fight that happened last week. This is a lot better. And what I saw, I've never been able to get over that. So this was uh, Corrales' second fight at uh, lightweight. Um, he had won the WBO strap by knocking out professional quitter um, uh, Asselino Fritas. Uh, and this was Castillo's third defense of the WBC strap. Uh, he was been a previous champ, longtime lightweight champ. He's the closest ever to really beating Floyd. It's really close. Go watch their first fight. So this was a unification fight. Unlike the fight in Thriller Manila. Uh, Mr. Frazier was on his way down. Um, so they fought this entire fight in a phone booth. Uh, neither fighter ever backed down. There, was, there was, wasn't much boxing involved. There's a lot of machismo. Two judges had the fight 87-84, and then another had 86-85 heading into the 10th round. One for Castillo, two for Corrales. And the biggest reason why I love this fight is because it's one of the most dramatic rounds 
in championship boxing history that occurred in the 10th round. Castillo dropped Corrales twice in the 10th round. He proceeded to spit his mouthpiece out two times to, to buy some time, and referee Tony Weeks saw the ploy, and he deducted, some, he deducted a point for spitting out the mouthpiece, which made it a 10-6 round, making it impossible for Corrales to come back. So when Corrales went to go get his mouthpiece put back in his mouth the second time, uh, his trainer uttered the timeless phrase, you got to get in the fucking air inside now. And then he came out, knocked him out. It was one of the best fights ever, and he never fucking won again. And they both went to the hospital. Ding, 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 ding. You started me early. I know. That's why I gave you more time. <laughs> <laughs> Kenny Ken. Thrilling Malilla. You ready? I'm ready. Uh, so when you all, when we all have expectations for something to be great, the only thing left to do is to exceed it. And that's exactly what the Thriller in Manila did. Uh, Meldrick Taylor versus Julio Cesar Chavez is a better fight than Castillo Corrales. Marvin Hagler, Thomas Hearns is a better fight than Castillo and Corrales. Aaron Pryor versus Alexis Arguello is a better fight than Corrales and Castillo. Sugar Ray Leonard and Thomas Hearns is a better fight than Corrales and Castillo. But what is undisputed is that the Thriller in Manila, which has its nickname, you can call a fight, you can call an event by its nickname and everyone knows what it is, is the greatest fight in the history of boxing. Not only is it the greatest fight in the history of boxing, but it is one of the greatest sporting events of the 20th century. Why? Because the ramifications are both political. The Philippines were under martial law at the time of that fight. And the governor, Marcos, actually campaigned for that fight to happen so that he could change his perception to the world with what was going on in the Philippines, but it also for that night united that country. Muhammad Ali, because of his heroic exploits in the fight, actually has a mall named after him that is a monument now 40 years, some 40 years later. 15 rounds, they don't have boxing matches like that anymore. You got 15 rounds of life and death, literally, Ali said, I have never been as close to death as I was the night of that fight. There's nothing left to be said. The Thriller in Manila is the greatest fight in the history of sports, and it's not even close. Hmm. Half of that was bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> Which half? I mean, I, it, you know, it comes down to a pain. I just don't agree on... Some of the fights you said that were uh, better than than uh, Corrales uh, Castillo, um, and who cares if it's a, if it's a great sporting event? I care about the fight. I just so happen to agree that it was the better fight, <laughs> but um, I because but there is nothing I, that I've ever seen that that one round is probably the greatest round of boxing I've ever seen. Um, that does something to your heart, <laughs> you know. Mm. But the fight wise, I have to go with Thriller Manila. Yeah, to add to that, I think Thriller Manila was the first pay per view boxing match as well. To me, I think, but I've seen both fights at least three times. Uh, Thriller, Thriller in Manila is probably the greatest fight, but the most exciting. Like, if I had to sit down and watch a fight, it would be uh, Castillo Corrales. But it's that, not the whole fight. It's just it's not the it's not the whole fight that was that was no, it, great. It it was to me. That's why I, I argue that because they 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 didn't they basically fought inside the entire fight. Now with the thrill in Manila, to me, I go back and forth. I chose that because I you know whatever the the debate. But I think a lot that has to do with this. Ali took Frazier light in that fight and that's why it was better than anticipated and that's why it became so great because he thought he was washed up and he even has a line in it they told me joe frazier was washed up and frazier replies they lied <laughs> and they really were both n close to death in that fight it was, it was a great fight I, I just think that as far as competition wise because i think ali won the majority of that fight it wasn't as close as castillo corrales in my mind and when he uh, Corrales was up on two cards going in, and he had a 10-6 round and was done, and you better fucking get in there now. When that happened, and he blessed him with that perfect right cross, mm. and the, uh, the only thing I always see is I see James Tony and Winky Wright and the crowd behind him just losing their shit. 
It's just an exciting event. But no it, one has ever, no one, half of the people that hear this don't even know who the hell Corrales and Castillo are. Everyone knows who Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier are. But that is, act, that is literally their bat. It is. Because <laughs> that, 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 that may be true. All I care about is the W. I still haven't <laughs> lost. Kevin, what's in diplomatic immunity? <laughs> <laughs> So just some uh, some corrections. So the Toronto Raptors are the first number one seed in NBA history to get swept prior to the conference Jeez. finals since mm. the format was adopted in 71. That's LeBron they James. Are extremely disappointing. Uh, <laughs> the, Rockets did, the, the Rockets did close out the other uh, Jazz tonight, so we will be talking about you, Utah, on Thursday. Um, I have a baseball question. Uh, of course, Slug came through. He said... Do any of you think Manny Machado will be an Oriole by the All-Star break? Not if the Orioles are smart. I don't think it matters. I don't think... What's the... What, I mean, how many games back are the Orioles huh. currently? No, nah, we're not doing that. We're not doing that. We're not, we're not, we're not the doing worst record Well, league. your father's <laughs> oh, the, the worst. Question. The worst record in the league? Yeah. And the All-Star break is in July? I don't, he won't. I don't believe he will. I don't think he One will. One of the be. places they talking about is here. I know. That's why I didn't say that's nothing. Why I'm at, yeah, that's why <laughs> yeah, I don't. Yeah. With the injury, you guys recently had. An we injury need help, Kershaw, brother. Right? You know, we got a pitcher for you. His name is Kershaw. <laughs> Done. I heard that argument last year. Well, that is all we have from diplomatic community. So thank you guys for watching and tuning in. All right. We will see you on Thursday uh, for another episode of Confirmation Bias. As a reminder, follow us everywhere on social media. Our handle is at The League AM. Please visit our website, theleagueam.com. Please, please, please subscribe. Liking is cool, but sharing is caring. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, League Ambassadors. We will see you on Thursday. Shout out to John Paxton. Hit a no-hitter tonight for the Seattle Mariners. 5-0. Cheerio. You better get in there now. You got to have a Versace shirt when you do that. <laughs> <laughs>